<laughs> Are we ready to do some design? Huh? 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 Anybody? Yeah. Excited? Yeah. There we go. I want enthusiasm. This needs to be interactive. I want people yelling. I want you screaming and passionate. And I want lots and lots of questions. Sound good? Yeah. All right. <sighs> Let's get started. Mm. Oh, son of a bitch. Where? View? Page display? Full screen mode? God, I don't know how many times I've done this. It's embarrassing. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. Oh, it's so dark up there. All right. Well, you know what? That's just the way the cookie crumbles, huh? Um, all of my slides are on my website. It's a PDF on theelefanta.com slash slash qc uh, hyphen talk.pdf. If you feel you can see it better on your machine, go ahead and uh, pull that sucker up. Whatever, whatever floats your cheerio, huh? All right, full screen mode. We got this. All right, uh, hello, I am Justine Arreche, and I would like to see how many of you can pronounce my name correctly. Anybody, can you roll your eyes? There you go, Arreche, que bueno. All right, so I work for Edgecase in Columbus, Ohio. I am a graphic designer. Uh, I am actually a print designer who stumbled somewhat like Alice into the rabbit hole into the world of interactive design. Uh, funny story, we'll tell it later, you buy the drinks. How's that? All right, so today we're going to be talking about grid content and structure. We're gonna talk about color theory and typography, my favorite thing ever. Type tells so many stories, I hope you're pumped. But first we're gonna talk about grids. Um, let's think about why a well-designed website is important. Anybody know why it's important other than just because? Sir? It communicates. communicates. And it communicates clearly is what we really want to do. Yeah. All right. You want to look professional. Anybody in here has gone to a website, looked at it for five seconds, it looks shitty, it looks unlegit. Nobody wants to stay on a website that looks like crap. That's just a fact. If I see Joe Schmo sent me a link to this website and I look at it and it looks like messy, I can't find what I'm looking for, I don't even know what it is, I'm not staying on it, it looks unlegit, especially if they're asking for my money, unless it's porn, and then I say yes. <laughs> you wanna earn respect. People respect good design. And the same reason that it looks professional, you will be well respected. When I saw, heard about the QC merge, I looked at the design and I was like, hot damn, that's good looking. That makes my pants tight. So we want to make sure that we're getting respect, people respect good design, and results. Results are very important. If you have a clear, cohesive, well-executed website, you will get the results you need for whatever it is you're trying to achieve. The first step I think everyone should take when starting a website is to think of a grid. Grids are so important, I cannot stress it enough. Grids are like, like the house, you know? You can't build a house unless you get the lumber and stuff. If you do, it's gonna fall apart, it's gonna look like shit, people aren't gonna stay on your website. Even this presentation was made with a grid. I have six columns, you know, uh, everything needs to line up, helping, uh, helping me create a cohesive way to communicate my message. Everybody needs a grid. I use a grid on everything. I grid my house. I grid my clothes, my underwear, my socks. No, I don't wear socks. But everything else, I always put into a grid. Creating a grid creates cohesion, creates easiness for your eye to navigate around. It's very important. Don't ever start anything without a grid. Pasta. Pasta you can start without a grid. 12 column grids are probably the best way for you to go. You could simplify it, but you know, everybody I think for the most part starts with a 12 column grid. Uh, 12 column grids give you a lot of flexibility. And you're thinking, 
I'm not going to have 12 columns of crap. Well, you're not ever going to use all 12 columns unless it's a header or a footer. You can start by using all 12 columns. You can break it down into three, 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 and three. You can do, you know, uh, three columns of four, or you can use up the whole thing again. Um, also, you can do, you know, split it up into two things. Say you have an image of your super cool product, and then you need some copy or some features on the side. That'll allow you to do that. Keeping it in the grid is important. Here's an example of one way. Can you see that? Fuck. You can't see that, can you? Nobody? Anybody? You kind of, eh, eh? The teal's not coming through. Oh, I like this so much better. All right, so you see we have two columns used up over here, and then you have two columns blank, and then you're using up the rest of the columns. Then you have um, two and two, and then some copy at the bottom, and then the footer. So here's kind of how I would lay this out. Logo, navigation, image, features, features, copy, copy, footer. This is something you've seen probably a million times on the internet, and there's nothing wrong with that. People online already pre-programmed to think of how they're going to use a website. Their eyes are automatically going to look somewhere for the navigation. They're already going to look to the footer for maybe your site map. There are conventions that people have used on the internet for years that are going to help you lay out stuff. And you know, if you're, you're coming up with a website and you're not quite sure how to lay it out, go ahead and look online. It's not stealing. It's artistic creativity. <coughs> Excuse me, smoker. <coughs> I apologize. So what we're going to do today <coughs> is we're going to build, <coughs> sorry, we're going to build a website together. It's not going to be fancy. There's not, there's not enough time. But what I'm hoping you will have by the end of the session is the ability to confidently walk out here and think, I know what the fuck I'm doing because that's what's important. You need the confidence to know what the fuck you're doing. Um, we're going to look at phoenixcoffee.com. And since I'm seeing that a lot of you do not have uh, machines with you, let's bring it up. Oh, no. All right. This is phoenixcoffee.com. I'm from Lakewood, Ohio, which is a suburb of Cleveland. Born and raised. That's why I'm super awesome. Um, Phoenix is a local coffee shop from Cleveland, um, and this is their website. Barf-tastic. Um, it's cluttered, there's a lot of shit going on, I don't know where to look for anything. Sure, you've got this cool sidebar, but then you've got all this crap going on. And then I see Cleveland Brews, and I think of Cleveland Browns, and that makes me want to barf some more. Um, so we're going to take a stab at making this a little bit better, a little more cohesive, and uh, just frankly, anything's better than this. Um, so what we're going to do is take a look at some other websites that are using grids really well, using color really well, and using type really well. Everybody here heard of MailChimp? Super awesome brand, so cute, love that little chimp, he's precious. Um, so here's an example of how you can use a grid to convey your message really clearly. Phoenix Coffee Shop probably thought the sidebar was a good idea and you have all of this type over here. This is not working. People see lines of type this long and they don't want to read it. Scientifically, people don't want to read more than a few words per line, otherwise they get overwhelmed. So here we do, <coughs> here we have a nice bold headline, nice and just catches your eye right off the bat. Even though it's not screaming at you with a blinky type and it's not, you know, bright green, it still catches your eye because it's so bold and so large. <coughs> the sign up button, let's look at that for a second. Most people think sign up buttons should be green. Green means go, green, action color. <coughs> No, there's a great way to uh, get people to notice your sign-up buttons for, uh, really quickly without having to make them green. And we'll talk about that when we're going over the color portion. But what I want to talk about is this. <coughs> Four columns, 
Nice short lines, ooh, sexy, really nice. Also notice that there's a lot of space here. See all that breathing room we've got? That's nice. Breathing room is really important when you're developing your grid because the breathing room will allow the eyes of your reader to not get overwhelmed all at once. You want stuff to breathe. People can scroll down as much as they want. You don't need to, you know, pack it all up in within, you know, 760 pixels. That's nonsense. Everybody scrolls. I'll go like this all day. <coughs> you want to make sure that you're giving, you know, the appropriate amount of pixels in between each margin. Um, make sure that things have breathing room. Even between the headline and the copy, we still have all of this nice breathing room. It's really good. <coughs> and then down here, we break up the grid even more where there were two columns right here and then another two over here. We've just put this together and then here's this and then this. So this is another way to break up your grid. Sometimes people will go for a website that has all four across all the way down and that's fine. You know, that's, that's Swiss, that's clean, I'm into it. Love that. But uh, this is a good way to break it up, give your users um, kind of something unexpected. You don't want them to get bored scrolling down your website. <clears throat> and I feel the same way about the color blocks. The color blocks really help to kind of give you something unexpected. <clears throat> We've broken up the grid again down here into two columns. And then finally at the bottom, we're down to four for the footer. Is everybody kind of seeing how we can like break this up, move it around? but you're still all staying within the parameters of your grid. Is anybody lost? Anybody? Anybody's like, what grids are whack? No? I mean, speak up. I, I do not know how I'm going to use up two hours. Like, I want people to talk to me. Right. I'm going to ask you a slightly different <coughs> Sure. Were you as <coughs> Yes and no. It was maybe easy for me because when I was 14 and had no friends, I'd stay up in my room all day teaching myself HTML. Uh, so I kind of already had an eye for it. But I think print and web, although in the design worlds, can be very similar. They're also, um, they function differently. So can I change my, yeah, my go for it. Right. She has she has a she has, she has a graphic design degree, but um, as a lot of probably know, graphic design degrees don't always train you for being a good web designer. Oh yeah, I went to the Columbus College of Art and Design, and there were two web classes. One was in Dreamweaver, and the other one was uh, it was supposed to be a Web two class where I was going to learn JavaScript. Uh, but we ended up getting a client by the name of White Castle. Hey, classy client. And uh, we ended up doing a website for them instead. So how would you explain grids to somebody like that? Like, try to get them on board? To a print designer? Yeah, or somebody who doesn't have much background. A print designer should know about grids. Um, I'm not sure about your, yeah. your designer. Um, <coughs> I think all content should really um, come in a grid, um, even print. Um, but I, well, I was going to save it for the end of the session, but I would like to recommend a book called Bootstrapping Design. And it's made for developers. However, I think anybody would get a good, um, a good deal of information out of it. They go into length about grids, um, type, color. A lot of the stuff that I'll be talking about is also covered in that book. It's a really easy, readable book. Um, the guy's, you know, he's not pretentious. He's not talking to you like you're retarded. He's talking to you like you're a human being, which are the kind of books that I enjoy. So I recommend that to everybody if you haven't already read it. <coughs> yeah? Um, are you going to talk about like Using a grid does not necessitate a fixed-width layout. 
Um, I think if anybody has sat in on any kind of responsive talk or has worked on a responsive website, what really you'll come down to doing is making multiple grids that are designed to move. <coughs> But this talk will not specifically be talking about responsive design. I'm more hoping to give you a good idea of how to structure a website, how to make it so that it's um, you know, readable. I think that all of the things that I'm talking about are relevant to responsive design as well. Um, but specifically, I'm not going into that. Um, but grids, no matter if it's 12 columns, three columns, one column, five columns, you know, whatever, um, you still need to give the breathing room. You still need to have a hierarchy. Um, and what I mean by that is structure your website so that the important stuff is up at the top. You know, they want you to sign up for free. These are easy email newsletters. Uh, we have a monkey as our logo. Um, pricing, you know, all the navigation, you need to make sure that what's being conveyed up top is the most important. And I think that's one of the most challenging things about designing a website versus, you know, working on print is I have 80 pages worth of my message across, but you have the attention span of someone on the internet who, if they don't like what you're talking about in five seconds, they're going to go to Google and find someone else. So make sure that you're you know, thinking about the hierarchy. You know, MailChimp, for example, <coughs> got all the, necess the necessary information right in this blue box. And you don't want to scroll down, you can find out more information. And usually at the bottom of your hierarchy, you're probably going to have some kind of copyright, maybe a sitemap. Um, you know, again, they want you to sign up for free. I think they want us to sign up, people. Just a guess. <coughs> Um, I think that probably what they've done is come up with content and then tried to fit it within. Um, in print, there is a vertical grid, but I think online it's less necessary. You kind of figure out where your content needs to be and then design it around that. Personally, I prefer to have content before design. If I start designing something before I have a wireframe, I'm just going to design crap and then, you know, they're going to be like, oh, well, we need this form and this stuff. And I'll be like, I don't know. I don't know where you're going to put it because I didn't design for that kind of space. So, um, but here's, a, here's another one that we can look at. This is Nest, smart thermostat, super sexy website. I don't think I've seen a sexier website in a long time. Um, but again, you know, we've got the same thing. Your logo's in the left corner, the navigation's over here. And I think for some designers who aren't used to interactive design or people that just haven't thought about it, they're like, oh, I want to do something different. I want to surprise them. Don't surprise them. They want to know where they're going. It's like putting, you know, chocolate all over your road map and you have to like dig through the chocolate, try and figure out what highway you're supposed to be on. Like, nobody wants to do that. I just want to go. So I think it's, um, this is another good example of repetition's fine, you know? Make it interesting with your graphics or your message. Like, you know, using the same layout for things is absolutely fine. Nobody's going to be like, you're an original. No, that's it's just what people want to see. So, you know, again, we've got this separated. We've got three things right here. <coughs> we've got it split up again over here. And then, you know, back down, copyright, terms of service. Um, newsletter and stuff like that. But again, all up within the very, the very reaches oops, of, my, uh, of my display, I see everything I need to know. This is Nest. It looks like a super sweet thermostat. You know, um, play the video. You get all of your information at the very top. The hierarchy has been designed so that you know where you are in the very beginning and then the rest comes after. Um, Shopify another really nicely done website. Projector is not doing it justice. It has all these nice like textures in the background, real nice. Um, again, so here's our features. Play our little video guy, what Shopify does, the navigation, and then wait, this one's really fun. Watch the logo, wait for it, wait for it. Oh, that's so cool. Developers are the coolest. God, I wish I could do that. It's really neat. But um, you know, this is just another example of how we can how we can break up this grid. 
You know, it's see how it's used in all these different ways. And even over here, this is another great thing that can be done. You, you have your first paragraph of what Shopify offers, and then you break it down into little features. Like, oh my god, that's just so good. That's really good design. Um, down to three again, and then here's our footer. So you see how we're still repeating some of the same elements, but we're doing it in a way that's appropriate for our company. We've got our features. We've got, we want you to sign up. We've got all this stuff, but they all look very different. I think we can all agree on that. Make your message about, you know, your colors or your typefaces or whatever. Don't, don't make it about, let me try and hide the navigation and you can run willy nilly looking for it. Um, is everybody kind of clear on what I mean by hierarchy and what I mean by grids? Do we all kind of have a grasp on that? Does anybody have any questions? Does this carry over to mobile? Yes. Mobile is still using a grid, however, it's smaller. There's, you know, maybe one or two columns, but you're still going to use one and you still want those margins of breathing room and you're still going to want to make sure that you're creating a hierarchy that is, you know, first things first, especially mobile. I think mobile is even more important to think about your hierarchy above all. You know, you know what content you need to be on your responsive site. You want to make sure that you're getting things first things first. Um, for some people who are developing a responsive website, and maybe the desktop version's already been done, the very first thing you do before you touch anything is you look at your content and you decide, you know, what's most important. What can we, what can we afford to knock down a couple, a couple elements? Um, that's always very important. Does that kind of answer your question? Okay. Sir? Yeah, <clears throat> MailChimp, I don't give a damn that you have a big monkey on your website. What a waste of space, yeah. right? Um, mostly I picked these websites because they were diverse and had clean grids. Um, and when we get over to typography and color, we're going to talk about why these websites in specific I picked. Um, I think Nest is also wasting a lot of space up here. Even though you've given me all your content, you're kind of giving me some like image masturbation over here. Like great, pretty colors, but you know, let's talk about the thermostat a little bit more. And uh, Shopify could be a little cooler. I like your textures, Shopify, don't get me wrong, but it's a little bland. I think mostly I picked them just because they were really good examples of clean design. And I think things, especially like the Phoenix Coffee Shop, get really cluttered these kind of boil it down into a little, something a little bit more simple. Hmm? Hello. Oh. Well, first things first, it's not responsive. There is a mobile version though, I saw it. Yeah. No, this website's great, although I really would have liked to seen my photo up here just because I'm so cute. But, you know, Jen's pretty too, I guess. But um, this one's good. I think we could uh, get a little more up here. Can we all agree on that? Maybe we're wasting a little bit of space in Gaslight? <laughs> they know I love them. I'm just in it for the keg. Does so anybody else have a website they think maybe is good or bad and want to talk about it? Want to talk about why? You should take a look at the, the website where I work. Where is it? Uh, spelled with a Y or an I? Yeah, Museum.org. Well, it takes a really long time to load, gosh. Bored already. Ooh, Pompeii. So sad when this, the puppy. I know, I know. It's really I got so sad about the puppies and the horses. The people, man. The puppies, though, they didn't know what was going on. So sad. Oh, and the polar bears. I'm sorry, I'm getting sidetracked.
It's a nice grid. Got your you got your little guys going on over here. Did you do this? I did not. I'm so Gotcha. So you're in charge of these guys. That's fun. I wish that was my job. I'm so good at using Twitter. I wish it was my job. And by good at Twitter, I mean I'm really good at tweeting when I'm pooping and how big it was and what I ate the day before. <laughs> Don't follow me on Twitter unless you want to talk about poop. It's a fact. I always feel bad when people start following me on Twitter, especially like developers, because they see I work for Edgecase and they're like, oh, cool, she's a girl, that's so rare in the development world, and she must be fun, she looks spunky. And then they're like, I subscribe to something called Quitter, and it lets me know when everybody unfollows me. So I'll know when you unfollow me. No, it doesn't make me sad ever, because I know they just couldn't handle the truth. <laughs> All right, well, if there are no more questions, and let me know if there are, um, I would like you to try and fix Phoenix Coffee Shop. And the first thing we're going to do is do a uh, wireframe in 12 columns, please, unless you feel inclined to do mobile, but we're, we won't be discussing that. But if you feel like that's a better use of your time, you're more than welcome to. Um, and what I would like to do after we all have, probably give you about 10, 15 minutes to do this, um, unless you guys wrap up quick. But what I've started is, yeah, CX6, it's sexy, it's so dark. Loves it, loves it. The new live trace feature is amazing. It makes ripping off typefaces so much easier. Well, you know, I'm making a mock-up. I'm not going to pay $600 for a typeface that maybe I'm going to buy down the line. You know, I just want to take a screenshot and go, live trace it, baby. So what we're going to do when, um, when I've explained what we're doing, after I've explained what we're doing and you've done it, we're going to go into this master file and see if we can all agree on a nice layout for the Phoenix coffee shop. So, you know what? Command L. That's so much easier. All right, so what we need to include, this isn't going to include everything that's in phoenix.com's website, but it's going to include most of it. We need the logo. We need the navigation, search bar. There is a company info paragraph. There is a newsletter subscription form. There is a wholesale special advertisement, social network information, and the contact info. And if anybody has any questions, I can always, you know, come around. Um, I'm barefoot. My feet might smell. I apologize in advance. But Cincinnati's hilly, and those shoes weren't made for walking. But um, so what I want you to pay specific attention to is your hierarchy. I want you to pay, pay attention to what things should be grouped together. I have not listed this in any sort of order. So you're on your own. But think about what things need to go together, what kind of information needs to go together, what kind of things should be at the top or the bottom. Um, and if anybody has any questions, you just wave your hand around, fart, do something. I'll come over and uh, see if I can give you a hand. Sound good? 10 minutes sound all right? Think you can do it in 10 minutes? I'm rooting for you. I'm happy to help if anybody wants any, run something past me. Yeah. Which I think is asinine. I, I agree because Photoshop does not give you any flexibility. It's not a, ve I mean, you can do vectors, but you're like making it way harder for yourself. Yeah. How, does everybody, is it like a general consensus that we use Photoshop to design our websites? Do you? Yeah. Um, a wireframe. I think wireframes are like, if you're starting a painting, you're going to sketch it out first before you put paintbrush to canvas. 
Wireframes allow you to be organized and generate your thoughts quickly, um, as well as keeping in mind, I think wireframes help designers step back from the graphics and understand what programmers are going to be needing to do. You know, um, I always, so many times always a print designer way, will like go off way and too do into colors and types of fun like if I start graphics all over on the, the place computer. Really and like I remember and starting off college off and to like, a developer start on the computer and, and they're going like, to shoot you in the this face. This is the digital because they're like, I don't feel like I'm going to use the computer if I want the whole goddamn website. And now that I'm I don't old, want to I'm have like, oh, a million yeah, paper, divs yeah. all over the place. Wireframes, so, if you're using it in a grid, later, I really help to already create divs that you're going to be developing later on. Um, so wireframes, 24. I think, are very helpful for look, designers look at, and developers. Look at these lines. You can always run your wireframe. And I'm a smoker, developer. So I'm getting all that uh, weird leather unless, you know, face. you're developing it yourself. If you would have looked at me uh, pictures when I started, you know, sit down with them. I know. Talk about, say, I know. I'll be 25. Hey, this is the structure mid I'm thinking about. And that's old. I was thinking this feature. Like on I start this getting that discounts on car insurance. No yes or no? I sit right next to my developer at Edgecase. I don't want to. So we always have this constant. I don't know if I'll make it that far. between whether or not Justine's being retarded or whether or not it's feasible. Does that kind of answer your question a little bit? Not really? Kind of? No? Meh? Yeah. Yeah, that's way down the line. You know, slicing is totally different than a wireframe. You know, I feel like I should maybe bring up what a wireframe looks like just so that we're all kind of on the same page. I don't want anybody here to feel like they can't ask me a question like that. Like, I don't know shit about programming, and I'll ask you what a couch is any day, you know, or futon or whatever your weird database, cucumber or something, <laughs> Ruby, I don't know. All right, wireframes. What? Do it. <laughs> Am I not connected to the internet anymore? Yeah, I am. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, you switched to one, seven, seven thousand. The fuck? Network. Don't tell me these things. I don't get it. <laughs> it's not working, smart people. Well, fine. I'll draw out a wireframe. I like them apples. <laughs> All right. So Justin, I told one of my friends more to design from the big one we're working on. Uh-huh. He said uh, we worked on the Phoenix coffee site two years ago, but they were impossible hippies. Uh, I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely believe that. I got a load of stories. Yeah, it's about making, uh, you know, compromises and understanding what's worth fighting for. Like recently, I was working on a client project that um, <coughs> just they had this, this idea in their head. They wanted it to look just like this logo. And I was just like, all right, you know, let's, let's think a little outside the box here. People come up with your own identity. And, uh, you know, it was just a give and take. I had to just kind of compromise on some things and just be like, okay, you can have it on all lowercase, fine, whatever. But I'm not making it orange because every other competitor is orange, so we're not doing that. And I had to like sit down and explain it to them and finally got it through their thick heads that we weren't going to make it orange and this is why. I think it all, talking with clients all boils down into you need to be able to communicate why you're arguing against them and make sure that they're understanding. All right, so when I'm talking about a wireframe, this is pretty much what I'm talking about. Basically, what I you know, do is I start divvying things up into boxes, like I know I'm going to need a header, I know I'm going to need some copy and an image, or you know, stuff like that. This is like my first preliminary sketch into making a website before I design anything. I don't talk about color, I don't talk about type. I need to make sure that I am laying out the content in like a way that anybody who's looking at my website is gonna understand. 
So, um, and I, I do this with my developer, Jerry Numi, at Numi on the Twitter sphere. Um, we sit right next to each other and we'll talk about every single step of the process, including the wireframes. Um, there's Pixelmator, if anybody has used that. It's like um, Photoshop with less annoying features. There we go. There you go. See? <laughs> Awesome. See? Uh, um, I have a question. Is, is there a difference? So, is, is there a difference? So there's a number of apps like that you use OmniGrapple. Mm -mm. Okay, so like OmniGrapple is really good at, um, at like helping you line things up by showing you when you're. When you're smart, on smart grids. Is, is there a difference between, like, is, is, that a, is that a bad way to design on a grid, or is that not even considered designing on a grid when you design like that? I think you should always make something like this in the beginning. I think it'll, it'll help you. But I think smart guides are great because they help ensure that you're lining up with things. And you know, not all the boxes need to line up vertically, uh, I mean horizontally. You know, it, it doesn't need to be all this cookie cutter, perfect squares, boxes kind of thing. But I think that in your first stages of figuring out how to design a bomb ass website, that's a good idea to go with because it'll just help you get an idea. You want it to be clean, you want it to be consistent, you want it to flow all very well while still ensuring that you're having breathing room. I don't think it's a bad way to go, but I think it would help you to at least have lines in the background. I personally prefer the blocks because the lines get really lost for me. Um, but you know, whatever floats your cheerio is up to you. Also, what I do sometimes, um, I will make little sheets of eight by 10 papers with this little grid on it, print them out, print out like 10, and then just go ahead and start sketching. Like I was just saying, you know, you get so blocked up on the computer thinking about, oh, should I make this a one point stroke or two? I just, I just don't know. You know, uh, get off the machine, give your hands, some playtime. So I think that's really helpful. Is everybody kind of done? Everybody feel real good? Anybody think they have like the bomb diggity of wireframes going on right now? Somebody was being awfully chatty. That is not my fault. <laughs> there you go. So I want to start building this with you guys and I want people to start kind of shouting out what they think the very first thing from left to right should be. Logo. Logo? Yeah. You don't think so? Yeah. What do you think? Every coffee shop, every restaurant, every storefront should have very tiny pool across the top, contact, map, or a link to map, for God's sake, hours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can live with that. Can we, can we take a vote? Do we all think we can live with putting the, uh, the, necessi uh, the necessary information? Especially if you're on your phone, that's a great idea. I'm not trying to like swipe all over my iPhone while I'm driving, figuring out, is this on Vine or is this on whatever? Well, I think for the purposes of this demonstration, we can pretend that Phoenix is the only coffee shop in Cleveland, because I, I really like that idea, and that's thinking outside of the box, and you know, as much as I'm telling you it's okay to put your logo and navigation up at the top, that's a great idea. So if it's cool with everybody, we could start there. 
We all cool with that? All right, we gonna put that in. See, and this is exactly how I get when I start making a wireframe on the computer. I was just thinking, ooh, we could put this subtle drop shadow in and it'd be so cool. Damn it, no. See, even I do it. All right, what's next? Logo? Donde? Where are we putting that logo? Top left? Are we all cool with that? We all down with the logo on the top left? All right. Put that sucker in there. How many columns did you use? Two? Three? Three? Who, who did two? Raise your hand. It doesn't matter. So the logo was my my thinking with three. Well, so I actually had a logo that I found online that's much better than the one I have on the website. Uh huh. But my thinking with the logo is that it's kind of a recognizable part of you know, like like it's it's on the sign for everything that's copied. So right. Um, so having that kind of big um, on the site helps with that. Okay. Kind of kind of depends on like the aspect ratio of the logo too. Does. Yeah. If you have a round logo versus a square logo, you're visually, you look like you're taking up less space than you actually are. So, uh, you know, a square logo, it's just, it just looks big. Kind of want to scale that sucker down a little bit. Although you're always, always, always going to have a client who says, make my logo bigger. And I tell them, no. God, I had a dollar for every time. Uh, I hate it. God damn your logo. Yeah, I think, and I would agree being from Lakewood or the Cleveland area that I think more than people know the name the Phoenix, once they see their cups, you're, you're gonna think of their coffee shop. So is anybody opposed to making the logo three columns long? Is anybody is like, that's stupid. They have a lot of navigation, and if we're going to put that, it depends where we decide to put the navigation, I would say. Okay. It's true. Let's, let's make a compromise. Let's make it three, three columns for now, and then when we get to navigation, if we're like, this is whack, this ain't working, we'll just scale it down. Because that is the nice thing about doing it on the computer versus doing it by hand. Less eraser. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, I think it I think it depends on your identity as well, you know, like you know, something like Tumblr doesn't really have an iconic logo. So say Tumblr was a clothing store and I'm looking for it in the public, I'm I'm not gonna recognize it. So I think for this purpose that the Phoenix logo is pretty iconic and something you're definitely going to be looking for if you're driving around, you know, especially if like the weather's, the weather's shitty or something like that and you're like, where is this coffee shop? You're gonna look for the logo. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you got your like wife in the passenger seat, dear, nah, it's this, it's this. Um, you're trying to look for addresses and of course you can't see them. You can never see the address. All right. Let's start naming some of these suckers just to keep track of them. So we agreed this was contact information and address and hours. Mm -hmm. All right, so that is there. This is your logo. Whoop. All right, what's next? Fine workshop attendees. I'd say like, so I kind of did a, on the, on the right hand side, I did kind of basic, like 
like the basic navigation on it. So I think it's kind of the stuff we have up there. Mm -hmm. Do we think we can align the navigation bar with the top of the logo? You know, falling just under the contact information? Think so? Anybody got any other plans for the nav? You put the. Right, exactly. People look for search bars up in the right. What do you think? What about bottom line navigation? So you can have like one or two things like a search bar and then you kind of white space that's kind of crazy. Those are stuff that some search bars are I think, think that might be confusing to bottom align it just because people you know, you read from left to right and top and down, and most people are used to, you know, kind of like what we just said about the search bar, like we know where to look for it. Um, but I think bottom aligning it is, especially for mobile, you're compromising the amount of canvas space that you have in order to convey a message, and I, I think it might waste some space. But any, any other ideas? Can we all agree to? Uh, I put the navigation vertically down the left. Ooh. Because I saw, well, on the site, yeah, the, the navigation was all across the full width of the thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I don't have the site up, so I don't know what's what the board to trim down. But because of the number of elements, I thought, well, let's just put it on the left side. So I actually, I actually kind of started, started that route, but what I did is I broke out the navigation with things that like things that people will commonly be looking for, like vacation contact us about yeah. and stuff like that, like the really, really common elements. Yeah, yeah. so those are kind of hard to I always saw the numbers on the didn't actually see what yeah. they were, so. Yeah, <laughs> so I put those up in the top right corner, and then I started going down the left-hand side with the, like, shop online and also sort of stuff that are, that's, like, more specific to them. Okay. Let's see. So this is what I asked you all to include. Does any do, do we want to pull the Phoenix website up again? See what they're kind of doing. Does anybody need to see that? Um, I think that the specials can be down towards the bottom. The first things we want to convey is what Phoenix is, what it looks like, and then have the navigation. I think those are the most important things we need to convey. But um, I think that the, the wholesale special advertisement is just kind of like a, like a feature. Maybe it's like a monthly thing that they update their website for. and you know, that changes every month of what they're featuring. I think that could probably fall a little lower down. All right. Don't you want to, like, like with the net, like, find it on the platform or that work, but don't you want to kind of separate users into different channels, right? Because you have, like, users that, I'm just looking for a location, I want to give you money to talk right now. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I think it depends on the information you're looking to acquire. Um, like, you know, you pointed out some people are looking for wholesale. Some people, like, did everybody hear him? Everybody? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're looking, you know, for wholesale, you're looking to maybe find a shop, and I think that those are things that we would address as like a, a U, UX kind of thing, you know, like I think the Phoenix, other than needing 
like a facelift should address how they're getting people to come, you know, get information. I think that you bring up like a really valid point. Um, but I think just for kind of like the purposes of this talk, we maybe want to like, you know, ignore the fact that the Phoenix is neglecting their wholesale buyers as well as people that are trying to figure out where the hell in Lakewood, Ohio, the Phoenix coffee is. Um, but that's that's super super good point. Um, but I think just for now, I noticed we've already been talking for like an hour. I think maybe that's super in depth though. We can talk about this later. You buy the drinks though, remember? Um, so yeah, but I think we all need to kind of settle in on where we want to put the navigation. Anybody want to want to vote on it? Does any top top aligned with the logo? Um, Who? I had a thought on that actually. Uh huh. Um, so I like I said I actually used the Phoenix logo. Uh huh. And it's a triangle. Uh huh. And nothing looks good top aligned. Like it's it's hard to if, if you left the line with the chair left line with the logo, there's no edge there. Uh huh. It's, it's pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> So, we, we can write justify the navigation. There's nothing wrong with giving extra breathing room. White space is like this big thing everybody talks about, like, oh, the white space is weird. You know, no, white space is good, especially on a website. You want to give people room to breathe. You don't want to clutter up the navigation and not let people find it. So I am not opposed to write justifying the navigation aligned at the top with the triangle. Oh, oh. I'm straight across the top. Uh-huh. Like, Sorry, I think it's meant birthday line the horizontal line. Nah, right here. Okay, no, Should we do it? Do Who's it. with me? Do it. All right, we're going to do it. <laughs> All right. So obviously it's not that bad. Maybe we could go over here. You know, it could take up as much space as you really need it to. And you know, that's something you should always plan for is expect your client to want to add more pages down the line, because they always do. <coughs> navigation. All right, so we got our navigation. What's next? Search. Do we still want to put the search up in the upper right hand corner? Can we all agree that that's probably a good place to put it? Yeah. Because I mean, you know, the contact information and the address aren't going to take up the full span of that top bar. Mm -hmm. Cool beans. I'm in it. Let's do it. Search. Cool. What's next? This is the point where you say, how do I tell that text now? <laughs> and I tell him to stop crying. <laughs> Just kidding. Jerry and I have a very loving relationship. What's next, kids? I agree. Anybody else agree? Anybody disagree? Who wants to disagree with me? You do? But how do people know what they're subscribing to? Don't they need to know what Phoenix Coffee is? Obviously it's coffee, but it could be anything. Social? Okay. Right, like do I want to be a fan on Facebook if I don't know more about what it, where are your coffee beans from? You can quickly scan through the, the company paragraph thing and just pick up the Twitter or Facebook icons mm -hmm. very easily for scan. Mm -hmm. A headline, right? I think that's good. Sunny, I want to hear from some more, some people who have been really quiet. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of weird, kind of dumpy, kind of hippie. It's good coffee, though. What else? Anybody? Come on, quiet people. I don't like quiet people. I will rip the quiet out of you. So help me God. You're quiet. Stop being quiet. Yeah, I'm with him. I was thinking, I was kind of like this. I expect to see a big, pretty picture. Okay. Of a zoomed in photo of a top. It's the experience. Right. Something about the yeah. experience and what it is about the top and why you want to go there. Yeah. Is it, you know, is there a, their atmosphere? Is it where they get their beans from? Is it how they roast them? I think, uh, Right. And I, and I guess at that point, it really depends on why you drink the coffee you drink or, and where you drink it, you know? Like, I drink Starbucks, but that's because I'm pretentious and I get free coffee from the Starbucks down the street from my house. You know, it has to do with location, not how they roast their beans. So I think we all kind of need to decide what's more important. Do we want to demonstrate atmosphere? Or do we want to have a paragraph about how it's roasted and you know what their process is? That's a big turn Right. So I think it's important to them what the process is. Totally agree with you. I think at some point down the line you're gonna have this fight with this client. You want a pretty picture and they want people to respect their coffee because it's their business, right? That's what they wanted. So I'm on your side. I'm gonna kind of have to veto all the people who wanted the picture because I think the client wants to talk about their process. In my head, I'm thinking you kind of do like a semi-transparent, like giant background image of something relevant. Um, on See? Pages. Then that's exactly how you argue to a client. You think you need to demonstrate like you know atmosphere, but they're still stuck on the copy, and then you say. How about we have this cool JavaScript plugin that stretches to the you know size of your canvas, and you know then you can demonstrate that as well. On to that point, I guess a picture of four thousand words and roasting your own coffee is the big point. You catch the picture, then there's a reason to read that text as opposed to somebody just blowing by sites going oh, more coffee text two cares. Yeah. And moving on to the next. Yeah. So I, I think you know they obviously want it in there for a reason. You know that's why they have it. I think it's important to to talk about you know phoenixes because I you know I know the phoenix and I know that their whole thing is about respecting the beans and stuff like that and I think that there's a reason why they probably want to keep that in there but I'm I'm totally on board with the background image I think that's a baller idea does anybody think that idea sucks you got two hands in the back I was just say, I mean, what about a, a slider with, like, okay. It's mm -hmm. a good idea. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. a good idea. If we were to have small grids there, then we'd have a small one with a picture to show that there's a copy that they roast their coffee and then the explanation beside it. I mean, if we can get too fancy and having to interact to find out all this stuff, it's there. I'm proposing a compromise of what everybody's talking about right now. It seems like we're kind of indecisive about whether or not we, we want to put in pictures or the paragraph. And so what I will propose is that we split the paragraph up into columns and then put photos over those columns. We have three photos. We have three columns of type. What does everybody think about that? What's that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it would definitely benefit to have a headline, but I think I still agree with what some other people in here were saying is that we shouldn't cut the copy because they put the copy in there for a reason and it's an important thing to their business motto. But I think that I, 
I, I, th I think that putting it in columns will help it appear shorter than it is because you're visually only seeing three columns of type as opposed to one big heavy block of type. I think that that will, will help it look shorter and, and kind of encourage people to like skim it a little more than they would. You ever get like a really long email that's like four paragraphs long and as soon as you open it you're like, I'm not reading that. Because I know I do. I get those emails all the times, and then I miss out on meetings because I didn't read the last paragraph of five paragraphs. And that's kind of what it's like if you present someone with a big block of copy. Nobody's going to want to read that because it looks overwhelming. If you put it into shorter columns, you know, split it up, it's manageable, and people are going to want to read it more. All right, we really have got to move on because. <laughs> It's late, and we still have two more chapters to cover. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's just for intensive purposes. I'm, you know, I'm really enjoying like this dialogue. I was really worried everybody was going to be quiet, but I really want to thank each and every person who's speaking up and talking. I value everything everybody's going to say. Um, oh, I don't know if I told you this, but this is my first time speaking ever, so. I was really worried that I was going to get a really dull audience that just didn't care. You guys are super awesome. All right, so we've got you know three images. Then we can do some copy underneath. Split that split that paragraph up. Sound good? All right, what's next? Andale. I would probably, and I did that because I was starting to get lazy, um, I'd probably make it so that I have three that go all the way across. And there's nothing wrong with breaking the grid if you're going to break it in a way that still makes structural sense. Like don't just break the grid because you're like, my picture doesn't fit, you know? Like this makes sense. You want three across and you want it to align with the right justify navigation. So it makes sense to stretch it, and that's fine. Do it. Break the grid. Do it. I dare you. It's a good idea. All right, what's next? Anything else we need to add? Mm -hmm. Wholesale. Wholesale? Where should we put that bad boy? You don't know? Where'd you put it? Mm -hmm. No? Anybody else have an idea where they want to put the wholesale? Uh-huh. Anybody else? Anybody we haven't heard from, quiet people? These big boxes right here, yeah. these are images because I was hearing a lot of people talking about how they want to show the atmosphere. Um, these smaller boxes under here are actually the, the coffee shop's company paragraph split into three columns that you read left to right just because it's such a large block of copy and we wanted space for the images. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, if Phoenix Coffee, when we're redoing the website, decides they want to change their block of copy, then we could probably address, like, hey, here's, you know, this image is about the atmosphere. This image is you roasting your beans. Let's talk about the roasting process, stuff like that. I think that would be a good idea is to have each underlying block of copy correspond with the image. There's nothing worse than images that aren't relevant to your website or your copy. Um, but I think for right now, and in the interest of time, we should probably just go ahead and say it's the, it's the block of copy broken into three. So let's figure out where the wholesale is going to go. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think hmm? Pulse it. Yeah. Um I'd like to continue this discussion, but I think in the interest of time we really do have to move on. Um and if it's okay with anybody and let me know if you think it's not okay, I really feel like we should maybe move on from this just because I think we're all, we've all got amazing ideas. Everybody in here has got a good idea of how this website should be laid out, but we still need to talk about color and type. And I feel really bad about it, but everybody's had such great dialogue. I don't want to cut anyone off, but I think we really kind of have to. Is that okay? Oh uh, yeah, it's like whenever you get more than like two people involved in a design. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, but so let's move on. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Two hours. I didn't think I was going to be able to fill the two hours, and now I feel like two hours isn't enough. All right. So good job, guys. So now we're going to move on to color theory. Um, color theory and the colors that you choose to design with are more than just, I like the color blue because it's pretty. It's about you know thinking about what's relevant to the company or the website, thinking about your overall message. This is a color chart. It's a color wheel. Um, colors on the opposite side of the wheel from one another are called complementary colors. Um, they are colors that will create the most contrast for you know, putting them side by side. So if you put orange and blue side by side, they're going to contrast a lot more than you know, blue and purple. Blue and purple will kind of melt together. Um, and then there's also color psychology. And a lot of times you think, I'm going to pick blue because blue is just like, you know, it's a really mellow color. I really like it. Um, think about what blue actually means to people psychologically. Blue represents trust and focus. And you think about yellow. Yellow is, you know, like happiness. And there's a reason why McDonald's is yellow. It's because yellow makes you hungry. So, you know, that's no coincidence. The golden arches were designed for a reason. Um, so if you, you take these colors into consideration, you'll think you'll have a much more informed idea of why you're choosing the colors that you're choosing. You know, like, I don't wear black because it's slimming. I wear black because I have strength and intelligence. That's not true. It's because it's slimming. But, you know, think about these things when you're designing a website. Google color theory at any time, color psychology. It'll be a really good way for you to argue what colors you want to use if you're, you know, designing something and they ask you why did you make it yellow, you'll have a much more informed argument of why. So here's where we are talking about contrasting colors. You've got the yellow, or I'm sorry, the orange and the red colors that are close together. They're going to kind of blend in. It's going to create a more subtle look. Um, and then the blue and the red, um, they're on opposite ends of the color wheel. So they create this obvious contrast. 
And then when you're designing, just remember, white and gray aren't bad. You know, I think there's this stigma that white and gray are boring. But as we looked at and when we saw the Nest website, they have pockets of orange and blue, and they have dramatic photography. You know, that helps to um, compensate for the fact that you're using white. White can be very elegant. It's, it's not bad. Don't be afraid to use them. Now, I get this a lot, and I think people have a really hard time picking a color scheme. Um, I think, you know, for maybe people who aren't used to working with color or haven't taken a color theory class, color can be really intimidating. Picking colors um, within the same color is probably the easiest way you can go. So what I have is I have this teal color right here, and then I've broken down my color scheme into 50%, 30%, and 0% of that teal. You know, same thing works for painting your house. You don't want every single room in your house to be a different color, so you pick out tints for, of the same color. It works really well. You know, it's going to look classic. It's monochromatic. It's going to look really nice. And you know, if you're afraid to pick colors, that's the easiest way to do it. But if you're feeling crazy, you can pick contrasting colors and the color in between, and it'll still create a really cohesive look. So I have blue and I have orange, and those are contrasting colors because they're on opposite ends of the color wheel. The color in between them is green, and you can pick any variation of green that you want, but that's another color that you can throw in there. And then, you know, white or gray is always a good thing to add into there. <coughs> so picking contrasting colors and then the color in between is a really good way to make another, you know, classic, it's going to go well together uh, color scheme. All right. Another thing you want to think about, if you have wiggle room when making a website, you want to think about picking colors that not only are relevant to your product, but aren't competing with other major competitors. If I was opening up my own like home repair store, I'm not going to pick orange or blue because those are trademarked and really recognizable colors by Home Depot and Lowe's. So uh, for an example, a recent project I was working on, every single competitor, except for one, all were using blue. And I had to argue why I thought that we shouldn't use blue. I said, I, you know, look, look at this website, competitor number one, competitor number two, blue, teal, kind of weird baby blue. They were all using blue. So kind of think outside the box, you know. You're going to think about if you're doing a coffee website, your first instinct is like, I should be designing in brown. But I can guarantee you every other competitor is using brown on their website. So let's think, you know, think about something different. OK. Okay. Right, I'm, my mind. I'm not from the area, so I'm not from the coffee shop, but I work from Phoenix. And hey. I think, you have two, I think you have two cool ideas here, right? Like you can pull some coffee, like you said, a lot of people would pull some more coffee if they're visual brown, Starbucks green. However, Phoenix, again, I don't know the company, so I don't know if that's why they're called that, but Phoenix is also very visual. I would probably go with burgundy, teal, orange, which also I think are nice for coffee, but so they're worn rich. Um, the Phoenix logo is a, ph a Phoenix, so um, I think that we're lucky because the Phoenix is such a visual element, you know, you know, trying to brand something like Tumblr is hard because Tumblr doesn't mean anything, but Phoenix means something. Phoenix is a bird, a badass bird. You know, so I think we're really lucky we have that, and we should pick up on those color ideas um, to help separate us from the competition. Um, one problem I have with green, number one major competitor. Sorry, I peed really quick. I want to, you know, make sure we get everything in. That's what she said. Just kidding. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So their website actually isn't their colors. The color mm. signs are red and yellow. Mm -hmm. But their website is teal. But um, I think 
I think that picking the colors from the Phoenix is probably one of the best things we can do. You know, find, find inspiration in an oil painting. There's nothing wrong with going onto Google Images, finding a painting of a Phoenix, and color picking it. I do it all the time, all the time. I, I constantly color pick from images because if you go in and you find you know, a photograph you think is really beautiful, go ahead and color pick from it. There's nothing wrong with that. Nature creates colors that go well together to begin with, so why not be inspired by it and you know, borrow so it from So I nature. want you all to take, so I think that's a great idea, minutes, however long it takes it? me to pee. Um, to think about what My colors Gabron? you'd like to see used on the oh, website. Find, ready, set. Oh, yep. I should turn this off before I pee. How typography. Forget the hype on type. I know so many people that talk to designers and just like, you know, that designer was talking about, you know, something about these typefaces and they were arguing with me about how Helvetica is the best. I don't think you need to get into all of that. I think type is a tool that you can use to convey your message. I think it's really important that you are educated on the different kinds of typefaces, what kind of messages they're bringing forth, and how they can work for you. You know, you know this, all this Comic Sans and Papyrus shit is just, forget it. Throw it out the window, who cares? Comic Sans is not a bad typeface if you're running a kinder care program. Papyrus is not a bad typeface if you're running an Egyptian paper supply company. You know, <laughs> it's just they're not being used well in a way that makes sense. So let's go over basics. How many people here know diddly squat about type? Diddly squat? Ain't nothing wrong with that. I know that much. Yeah. Serif and sans serif. You wouldn't, you'd be surprised how many people have a hard time keeping serif and sans serif, uh, you know, apart in their heads. Serifs are the little feet, little guys on that R. See his cute little feet? I just want to put boots on him. And then sans serif is, you know, sans without feet. Serifs are traditional. They're easier to read. The I is scientifically proven to read serifs easier than sans serifs. And so that makes them great for blocks of copy. Blocks of copy are hard to read because there's so many letters all at once. If you make it a sans serif, it's probably going to be like 50% easier to read. Guarantee it. That's why all of the old novels are in sans serifs. They're just easier. Hmm? You're saying sans serif. Oh, I'm sorry. See? Look at me go. <laughs> that was a trick question. You passed. <laughs> Sans serifs, modern. So sans serifs became really popular around the 60s when you know gig posters became really big. You want to have big, bold, you know, parts of type that are conveying a message really quickly and from far away. They're great for that. They make a bold statement. They're probably one of the better things you can use for headlines, but you don't have to. You don't have to. These are just common practices and suggestions. So a lot of people have a hard time, or maybe they don't know they're having a hard time and I just recognize that they're doing it poorly. But um, creating a type family to use on your website, you know, you start picking out typefaces and you're trying to think of what's, what's going to work together. Um, we are very fortunate to live in a time where we can finally stop using Helvetica on the internet. Helvetica is great. I love Helvetica, but there are so many other awesome web fonts that you can use. And so right now we're going to talk about like how to best uh, pick out your typefaces. I think they do now, though. Doesn't it? I feel like it does. I forget that Windows is still a thing. Which makes me a terrible usability tester. <laughs> but, you know, keep it all in the family. Type families were meant to be together. The difference between a typeface and a font. A font is a file. A typeface is a well-crafted letter. You know, that's a really good way for you to differentiate what you're talking about. So type families, you know, if you open up Arial in your computer, you have Arial, Arial bold, Arial italic. Arial, you know, extra bold, whatever. That's a, that's a type family. And type families go really well together because they are essentially born from the same blood. 
So an example of that is DIN. DIN is a web font. DIN bold condensed is uh, a version of DIN. And then there's DIN regular. DIN bold condensed would make a great headline. It's bold. It's, you know, compact. It's powerful. You can get a lot in that space. And then wouldn't you know, DIN regular just goes so well with DIN bold condensed. So why not use them together? Edgecase.com uses DIN bold condensed and DIN regular. Secret. Don't tell anybody I told you. So, you know, those are, those are our typefaces. They go really well together. Don't make it hard on yourself. Pick type families, and you're still going to look really good. Um, choosing a typeface, like I said, that has multiple of options. Uh, universe. Universe is a typeface. It's not a web font, though. It is a typeface that has, like, seriously, 30 variations of the typeface. There's, like, super extended, super condensed. That's not called super. They have numbers, but, you know. Think about using type, type families that have a huge variety because then you can just kind of go all over the place. Like you can pick a super bold font for your headlines and then pick something condensed if you got a lot of, you know, stuff in your navigation. You know, think about that. So if you're feeling daring, try and go outside the type family box and pick out typefaces that have things in common. So Lucida type family has a serif and a sans serif version. And so by using those two together, you know they automatically are going to go well, even though they look very different because one's a serif, one's a sans serif. But there's, you can use those too. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a, you know, it's a marriage made in heaven. It's already done for you. Or if you want to pick two completely different fonts that have nothing in common with each other, think about things that are, have like similar elements. So this is Adele. And this is Gotham. And they both, you see how the stroke of the S is so similar on each one? So they have that in common. So they're naturally going to look really good together. Make it easier on yourself. Look at those little details about like widths, you know, stroke widths, stuff like that. It's going to make it way easier on you <coughs> if you want to pick type families that are completely different. If you want to create a lot of contrast, say you have a headline that you want to be really fun, bold, you want it to be the first thing someone sees, try thinking, you know, try using a display font. A display font, you know, some of the little, little cursive guys or the fun guys or the wingdings, you know, a display font will get someone's attention off the bat. You know, create contrast and they'll still pretty much go together. Yeah. Some of them are. <clears throat> Actually, um, Lucida isn't, I don't think, but Adele is. Um, you can use Franklin Gothic, I think, is a web font that looks just like Gotham. And then these are both web fonts. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go over that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So... Here, here's the slide. Here are some websites you can check out if you're looking for font variation on your website and you don't want to use something that everybody else has. MyFonts.com, they have a variety of typefaces from free all the way up to like $600, sell your mortgage, you know, those kind of things. Um, Typekit, Typekit you can use for free on personal websites. They're just going to put a little guy at the bottom of your screen which is fine. I have it on my website. I'm proud to say I use Typekit and Font Squirrel. Font Squirrel has a generator. Um, you know, if you're authorized to use a font on the web, you can use their generator and they'll make it for you, which is great. <coughs> so if you're looking for fun sites, I highly recommend these. And if you're having a hard time reading any of this, like I said, you can download these slides from my website and come back to these later. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like you can actually download them to your machine. You may be able to get only like one member of the family, like, um, as like a, you know, more of a file that doesn't have a Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm. There are many, many, many more websites out there, but these are the ones I use time and time again, and have 
always given me a lot of selection and quality product. <coughs> but let's think about Phoenix Coffee. <coughs> Sorry, I'm starting to lose my voice. Um, let's think about what kind of what kind of message are we trying to convey with Phoenix Coffee? You know, think about. And, I don't think we're actually going to end up picking out a typeface together because I think we're all going to have a million different typefaces if we learned anything from the grid challenge. So I think it's more kind of like an internal thing. Think about what typefaces are appropriate. You know, Phoenix is a young coffee shop. A lot of young people go there. So maybe an uptight serif isn't right. The rest thing. But <clears throat> Even though we're not going to go into this, I hope that everybody here kind of has a, a slightly better grasp on what picking a typeface means for your website. You know, if you want a display font, that's a little more fun. If you want a serif font, that's going to be a little more modern. Sans, or, sorry, I flip those up again. See, you got to start calling me out on that because I'm flipping them up again. But, you know, think about type is more than just. I'm picking Helvetica because Helvetica is easy and I know everyone likes Helvetica. It's about the story that the typeface will tell for whatever you're working on. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's I'm sure there are. I just wouldn't get tied up in it. You know, I think color psychology is a lot more, um, it's a lot truer than maybe type psychology is. There are certain things people think of when they see type. You know, if I see Franklin, Gothic, Bold or something, I, you know, I'll think of Swiss design or something, but that's me as an informed typologist. I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't think that that's anything anybody in here should really get worried about. That's, yeah, it's not important. Color, I think color psychology is way more important. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions before I can't speak anymore? <laughs> Anything somebody wish I would have covered? So, something we could talk about later? I promise I want to talk to you. I'm not just looking for free drinks. <laughs> Maybe a little. But you won't turn it down. But I'm not going to say no, right? Really, everybody's totally satisfied with the talk? Was it what you thought it was going to be? Yeah. 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 Well, you said you said next to your, your developer, mm -hmm. uh, like, where does information architecture in the US like, come in? Like, like how, do you, how do you work with that? Right? Because the whole brand equity and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have people constantly telling, well, what, I'll, what I'll do is I'll take the best notes possible and ask as many questions as possible and maybe go on a whiteboard with the client, start sketching stuff up, and that's when they'll tell me, no, we, we have you know, this here for a reason because we, it's been proven that that works the best and stuff like that. Um, but Edge Case, to be honest, is a, is a smaller company and we do mostly startup work and more often than not I'm building brands from the ground up where they haven't existed yet and I'm responsible for creating their logo in a week, their identity in a week, and then their website in a week. So to be quite honest, I don't know if I could totally answer that question for you. I, you know, haven't worked on anything at length that has so many, you know, prerequisites that I'm not allowed to make my own informed decisions of how I think it should work out. I feel kind of bad though. I'm not that good of a designer, you know. Anything else? What's your food? Is that it? Do we all just want to adjourn early? Nobody has any questions? Or are you just will shy? You, will you make your deck available? Yes, it is. It is available. Oh, it's the download from your site? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 
Sure. Yeah. You can do that right now. Right, meow. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry? Where is it at on your site? It's um, the T H E Elefanta, E L E F A N T A dot com slash Q C. Uh, I think it's QC merge hyphen talk. Yeah, Q, uh, sorry, QC hyphen talk dot PDF. It's right here. This guy. That's the, so, yeah, I can tweet it. Follow me, you know, so you can get the link and then unfollow me so you don't have to hear about my bowel movements. You think I'm joking and I'm not. <laughs> we came up with a new tool at work that we want to develop. It's an app called Poopstagram. <laughs> or we could always go with Poop with Friends. So uh, it'll be great. You can rate local bathrooms, take images, and then if you don't pay for the app, instead of getting ads, you get pictures of other people's poop. They used to have a column that uh, everybody <laughs> from the stall was That's awesome. Um, so this is a recent website I worked on. This is Git Immersion. Um, anybody who uses Git and is having a hard time learning it, I recommend Git Immersion. Um, there was previously a different layout for this, um, and I thought that we could tweak it. Um, since I started at Edgecase, I've slowly been rebranding it and um, kind of adjusting their visual feel since they didn't really have anyone to do that before. Um, but Git Immersion was kind of easy. I had already had all the content in front of me. I just needed to figure out a better way to lay it out. Um, so let's see if I can bring up my Illustrator file. Um, like I said before, I solely design an Illustrator. I don't, I hardly touch Photoshop. Um, and that's because I think it allows for flexibility. I don't have to, you know, um, if I change my mind about how big I want something to be, I can do it and it's no problem. Um, and especially for the web, I think it just creates something cleaner. So let's see. Is this it? Yeah. Oh, actually, and then I did a version for the iPad, so we can look at that too. Um, but. This is Git Immersion, and I did do the desktop version of Git Immersion before I even touched mobile, because Git Immersion is something that you're probably going to be working on your computer, but I'm understanding that you're gonna see a link on Twitter and you're gonna pull it on your iPad or iPhone. So I did make the first page um, responsive. So here's Git Immersion, and the first things first is we have a giant header. Um, then we want to explain what is Git Immersion. It is a guided tour that walks through the fundamentals, blah, blah, blah. And then the next most important thing that I p think people are going to want to do is install Git. And then, you know, maybe you want to use a GUI client. So you want those two. And you want it for Mac and you want it for Windows. And then the very, like, you know, the most important thing about GitImmersion.com is get started. You know, you don't want to dick around looking for the go button. Let's go. And this one is actually green. I did use the action color green, but that's because green is uh, in the Git Immersion branding. Um, and then, you know, underneath all that stuff is talk about edge case. You know, we provide training and all that stuff. So within the first, <coughs> you know, couple hundred pixels of my browser window, I have already established this is Git Immersion. This is what Git Immersion is. You can install Git or you can get a client. And then you can start Git Immersion. <coughs> so, you know, that's kind of the ways I go about that. And then, you know, start over here. When I go into the iPad version, I had to start thinking about what, what needed to be cut. We don't have the kind of space that we have on the desktop. So to install Git, you know, you can start Git Immersion here, but to run Git, you must be on your personal computer. So instead of having my graphical client buttons that would have taken up a ton of space on a responsive version, I just you know, straight up say, listen, you're probably going to have to get on your computer for this anyway. So that's something I can eliminate. Everything else collapsed down into 
uh, using up both of the columns or using two columns. And then, you know, edge case, brand, you know. <coughs> that was probably one of the more recent things I've worked on where uh, I found myself having to like really think about hierarchy because I was, I was redoing a website that had no sense whatsoever of what was important and what wasn't. Yeah, either one of you, you pick. Uh, four. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm curious. So there's there's kind of a move. I, I, I know it's kind of a movement in the design community to move more towards like getting out of out of tools like this and either just straight to HTML. Mm -hmm. um, especially in a lot of the circles that educate learners. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that, especially being somebody who learned HTML first when you were when you were Yeah. Young. Um. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, and I think that it's especially good for responsive design instead of getting caught up on, you know, um, graphics and, you know, oh, I'm really set on this being this many pixels wide. It's kind of like if, if, if instead of us drawing out our, our wireframe like we did, what if we just set that up in HTML first and just start plopping stuff in? Because, because I'm the kind of designer that likes a lot of attention to detail in terms of graphics, and I'm I'm under no delusions that they're important. I just think that they kind of like set you apart. So even though you can't see it on the screen, you know, in my presentation I had a really subtle grain texture. I had all of this stuff, and I. I feel when I start developing things straight into HTML before I do anything with Illustrator, I lose those things because I just start to settle with colors and boxes. But that's just me, and I don't think there's any right or wrong way to do it, and people can argue with me. But, you know, that's just my personal opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I always cut it up. I don't want anybody touching my comps. Mm -hmm. You are not cutting up my baby. And that's another nice thing about working with Jerry is Jerry's enough of a designer to be sensitive to like the little things that I'm picky about. So we're a really good balance and I honestly feel sorry for people that don't get to like have that kind of partnership with whether it's their designer or their developer. I, I mean, I think you sh might say, well, you know what, maybe they can't slice it up because they don't have enough web knowledge. You can't slice stuff up if you don't know how it's going to be used. Yeah, that's, you know, um, I think for me it's easy to know how to slice things up because I have limited web knowledge, but, you know, maybe for our other designers they're just not aware. That's pretty just basic. It's Git Immersion's primarily a tutorial, and so once you step into there, it just becomes a manual of sorts with your bookmark and your table of contents. It was designed to be as simple as possible. Thank you. My job is done. Does anybody else have any comments, questions, concerns, propaganda? Uh, it's type kit. Yeah. 
different dynamic stuff versus all of the sort of static eccentric stuff we've been talking about. We talked about the coffee shop earlier, and I was listening to the hours thing. I was like, no, I don't want hours, I want to be green, yes, we're open, red, right? no, we're not open, we're going to be open for another 45 minutes. Because the, the server knows what time it is. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that. That's a really good idea. You know, from a design perspective, there's all this additional stuff now. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, if they're going to close in 15 minutes, maybe it should be yellow, and then you should get to start fast, and then, you know, that kind of stuff. And audio, yeah. All that sort of traditional stuff represented in a way that sort of, you don't have to build all that traditional stuff, because then you have to drag in the whole tech team to work with that traditional one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what I do, Illustrator has a feature where you can um, copy your entire artboard. Um, you just um, option click, drag, um, and that will copy everything that you've had on that artboard. So say for you know this purpose, we're talking about the Phoenix website and I want to represent it's green when it's open, it's yellow when it's about to close, and it's red when it's you know closed. So I'll have three artboards just to show it because I don't want to leave anything to chance. I have a, a, oftentimes talking to clients, I'm trying to explain something conditional, and they're like, you know, I just I really want to see it, so I, I'll just copy my artboard. It takes five seconds, and you know it's not difficult to do. So um, I think that's a really, really beneficial part. I think it was CS4 where Illustrator came out with artboards and like multiple artboards in a file and it was like the best thing that ever happened. When I was working on the JRubyConf uh, website, I literally had like a million artboards in one file, which yeah, it gives you a really big file, but you're not hunting around in 10 different files to look for what you're using. So you know, if I go to document setup, edit artboards, I can click on which artboard I want to copy. I option, click, and drag, and I can shift option, click, drag if I want to keep it all centered. So now I have two of the same thing, and I can go in here and change whatever I want on it while keeping. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I usually prefer to give my presentations in person, but when I won't be there, when art boards are going to be looked at, I, I will write into great length, you know.